I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. Well, fear, being afraid. Ugh. So let me just take a quick peek at what's come in the chat so far. I see a lot of lovely, wonderful things. Um, exploring the sense in the present of being undisturbed, undefended, unbound, uncontracted, gradually opening into unconditioned is a really good and deep meditation, exploring what's real. If there are times when we do feel contracted, we are uh, scared or angry and lashing out, that's real. But at the times like a meditation where you can observe that actually uh, you can release fear in the present, you can still function, you might still be experiencing pain, there might still be problems in, in the future, but in the present, you can receive the moment without fear. And as I was meditating, I'll share with you, and it's relevant to my talk, that uh, to be able to really uh, be prepared to receive the arising moment without fear, we have to deal with the ways in which the brain is a prediction machine. It is designed to keep making predictions about what will come, and then it matches what has come, what's actually occurring, with what it predicted to both improve those predictions and make sense of what has happened in light of the predictions. The problem is we can get stuck in our predictions, and if we are predicting by tendency, such as in my case being, I think, biologically a little anxious by tendency and then having things happen in life that seemed like problems. Well, that continual prediction can um, be tilted toward threat and can predict that somehow you, you or I won't be able to manage what is occurring, what is arriving in the next moment. Right? It's predicting it. It's predicting a problem. And I found myself during the meditation, I was doing it with you, being aware of this and gradually releasing that prediction of trouble and uh, that I could not handle and more uh, resting in a growing confidence that whatever a appeared, whatever arose, uh, could be managed in some way or I, I could accept it fully. Even if it was ultimately devastating, um, I could still accept that and receive it without fear. So that's an invitation for you to be aware of your own mind, the subtleties of prediction, and what you could gently uh, exercise wise efforts with regard to inside your own mind so that you can receive the next moment without unnecessary fear. Uh -huh. Okay, so I want to open up this topic, and I'm going to do it in a way I don't think I've, I haven't done it a long, long time. I'm going to start with an article from a recent issue of Science Magazine, which, if you like knowing about what's happening in the world of science, is a lovely magazine to subscribe to. The articles in the back tend to be really quite technical, with graphs and other, other crazy things, but the articles in the front you know, they're readable and you might enjoy them. Well, this particular issue is the March 15th, 2024 issue. And in it is an article about a paper in this issue about how does it happen that we generalize, unnecessarily generalize fear? What actually is going on in the brain when that generalized fear is switched on? So this is going to be a little bit of a 
kind of a exploration of some, you know, some of the hardware inside our nervous system. And uh, I'm going to relate that to how we actually acquire unnecessary fears and therefore what we can do both to prevent that and uh, once we've acquired unnecessary generalized fear, um, what can we do to gradually pull those weeds in the garden of our mind and to the point of eventually actually even erasing them, all right? Okay, so first of all, to bring it down to earth, think of the ways in which the fear spectrum is useful. It's useful. It evolved in us biologically to be helpful to ourselves, to our primate ancestors, our mammalian ancestors, um, fish. Uh, we have a pond in our backyard and um, with some large goldfish and really large koi at this point in it. Uh, and, you know, if I go out on to the edge of the pond and if I move too quickly, the fish startle and zip away. Uh, that fear response, you know, there's a place for it. It's not that fear is bad. On the other hand, it's very helpful to appreciate that anxiety, particularly chronic generalized anxiety, is really uncomfortable. That background sense of dread, ugh, apprehensiveness, or when we're around people or in certain situations, we avoid them because we're scared of them. We don't feel fear if we've successfully avoided them, right? So we hardly even notice that we've done that if avoidance has become a habit. But in those ways, both in terms of creating unnecessary, creating suffering and creating, um, leading us to play small, avoid vulnerability with other people, muzzle ourselves, shrink behind the bars of our invisible cage, fear is problematic in certain cases. And it's also really useful as you approach what's problematic about anxiety to realize that we can deal with threats without feeling anxiety. We can be strong, we can be determined, we can be alert, our heart might be pounding, but we're still mobilizing ourselves to deal with the threat without um, being invaded and hijacked by fear. The classic example of that for me that I've shared before uh, is rock climbing, where I'm in hazardous situations, especially when I was doing it more often, uh, while still feeling really competent, really solid, and not particularly scared. I mean, the heart's beating a little bit, and there's a sense of heights initially until I adapt to it. But overall, um, managing threats, managing challenges to safety, managing discomfort and pain, but without being invaded by anxiety. So that's the opportunity. And so you might be reflecting here about what are the ways in which uh, dread or fear or you know uneasiness um, is playing a role in your life that you'd like to be freer in relationship to. So it's real for you, this topic about fear and why it matters to you. So here is, I think, some super cool science. Some of it might be uh, already known to some of you, and all of it might even be known to a few of you, if you read the same stuff I do recently. Uh, it goes like this. So in your brain, okay, brain, are 85 billion or so plus or minus, neurons, and another 100 billion or so support cells. Neurons are connected with each other on average at several thousand points per neuron, which gives us in the human brain something on the order of several hundred trillion little microprocessors sparkling away. This remarkable biological apparatus is the result of 600 million years of evolution of the nervous system. And one of the ways that scientists are understanding what's going on in you under the hood is based on 
uh, recognizing similarities between structures and processes in our own brains and those of simpler animals um, uh, uh, of the sort that we have evolved from. So there's a lot of information that can be gained about what's going on inside us by examining the brains and the nervous systems of primates, other mammals such as mice or rats, and even going farther back in evolutionary time, examining the stru structures in the brains of, of fish and reptiles and even really simple creatures. So there are a lot of similarities in particular but, uh, between the underlying neurobiological machinery of emotion and emotional learning, like the acquisition of fear, the learning of fear. There are a lot of similarities between the machinery of that apparatus inside you and me and inside the brain of a little mouse. Now, I'm going to be talking here about uh, research on non-human animals, which is fraught with ethical complications. Fraught. And one of the um, processes for me in my life that's been very meaningful to me and gathering momentum in, in recent years is a sense of fellowship and kinship with really all of life, you know? Um, there's a line in the Buddha Dharma, something like, all beings tremble at punishment. Uh, all beings um, want to keep living. Uh, I look at these little ants crawling around in our house, especially after the rain, and I, I look at each one and I go, wow, at some level you want to keep living too. So uh, a lot of implications here, including having to do with things like what we eat and um, do we use leather goods and things of that sort. I'm not gonna be getting into those ethical topics in this talk. I just want to acknowledge them. And, in a, and as part of this, express my sorrow and my gratitude for the, the mice um, who were sacrificed, they were killed in the process of the research that I'm about to describe. Little beings like you and me who wanted to keep on going. So, back to the nervous system. Um, <clears throat> in your brain, there are nuclei, little nodes, in the brainstem. One is called the RAPHE, R-A-P-H-E, nucleus. From the RAPHE nucleus, neurons spread throughout your brain, including into emotion learning centers of the brain, emotion and motivation, such as the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. These neurons from the RAFE nucleus are serotonergic. They release serotonin, a neurochemical, at these various intersections called synapses between millions and millions, billions and billions of neurons in your brain, okay? So there's a physical process whereby a little tiny cell body of a neuron, you could put roughly five of them side by side in the width of a single hair. That's how tiny the cell bodies of neurons are, out of which shoot these little wires called axons that extend up into your brain and make connections with other neurons there at synapses. At a synapse, when a neuron releases neurotransmitters, they get received by and taken up by the downstream neuron. It's a little bit like at uh, tiny, tiny gaps. You could put several thousand gaps in the width of a single hair. At these tiny, tiny gaps, little, little bubbles of molecules are released into the space between the transmitting neuron and the receiving neuron, 
And then the receiving neuron takes up those little molecules uh, kind of that are docking in effect at the downstream neuron, and then that initiates a whole bunch of chemical processes. So what's being released at those synapses often multiple times a second makes a difference. So now let's think about a single neuron, okay, uh, coming out of the RAFE nucleus in the brainstem. Uh, and down this long tube, leaving from the cell body, different chemicals are manufactured, and in the cell body they're manufactured, and they're carried down this long tube to be released. Okay, now here's, here's all the, how all this relates. What was recently discovered is that there are um, groups of neurons that when they fire, they release two kinds of neurochemicals, not just one, at a particular synapse. So there's a class of neurons that release serotonin at the synapse, and they also release uh, glutamate, glutamic acid. All right? So wow, first of all, you have a neuron releasing two kinds of neurotransmitters, which defies what was previously believed to be dogma in brain science, that first neurons only release one kind of neurochemical and certainly only one kind at a particular synapse, and second, that whatever kind of neurochemical a neuron releases is fixed over the lifetime of the neuron. There's a point here that I'm getting at. Well, so here's what the studies showed. And think about the comparison to human situations in which we um, experience something scary in a particular situation maybe giving a little talk when we were in school or having an authority figure or being in an elevator when something scary happens like a loss of power or opening our heart and getting disappointed, okay? It's appropriate to learn um, about that particular episode. The problem comes when we overgeneralize from that single episode to many, many similar kinds of things or to life in general. Um, I was describing in my meditative experience a kind of overgeneralizing to the future altogether so that at a certain visceral level, I had to help myself not be afraid during the meditation of the next moment of the future arriving, right? People who experience trauma <clears throat> perhaps on a battlefield, perhaps in other situations, then uh, the issue is that they overgeneralize to many other situations in which they feel afraid, contracted, triggered, um, and traumatized. So what can we do about that? So here's the, what the scientists discovered. They found out, so imagine two different situations. One situation is that a mouse is put into a particular kind of little cage or a little pen, and it receives a very mild electrical shock in that pen. Okay. Then, understandably, it doesn't like that pen <laughs> when it's brought back to it again. It, it does things that mice do when they're scared. They kind of slump down like that rather than walk in sniffing away and feeling confident, all right? So mild discomfort, mild pain that is not overwhelming teaches us lessons. Like, oh, okay, don't go back into that weird little shaped pen. But meanwhile, the same little mouse who has received the, the unpleasant experience in this pen is not afraid of these pens is not afraid of walking into these little places where there's food, okay? So far, so good. But take that same mouse, and instead of a single little unpleasant shock in one pen, 
multiple unpleasant shocks are delivered to the mouse fairly briefly, but still, it's not at all nice. It really doesn't like it. And then what happens is that that mouse is now afraid of all little pens. And when it's brought into different pens, it still shrinks and cowers in fear. It has overgeneralized based on an intensely stressful experience. And the marker of that, a key mechanism of that in the brain, is that the neurons that come from the mouse's RAFE nuclei, they have the same kind of nucleus in their brain stem. It's more, it's simpler and so forth. It's different in some ways than ours, but it still releases serotonin neurons, right? A switch gets flipped when the mouse is exposed to, let's call it intense stress, a switch is flipped inside a whole group of neurons so that instead of releasing serotonin and glutamic acid, they switch to releasing serotonin and GABA, another key um, neurochemical, neurotransmitter. And that switch uh, is associated then with that mouse generalizing fear unnecessarily to all kinds of other settings. And a key to that switch is the release of cortisol. If the metabolism of cortisol is disrupted for that little mouse, then the switch doesn't flip and the mouse does not overgeneralize from you know, the intense stress of multiple foot shocks, five, they deliver five. Um, the, the, the mouse doesn't like it, but it doesn't overlearn from that experience and overgeneralize and apply that same shrinking and avoidance and I'm sure suffering and discomfort um, to other situations. So let's have a quick little recap. First of all, just to me, I totally geek out and I visualize um, the amazingness of a single cell being affected by a surge of cortisol in a way that it flips a chemical switch and starts producing GABA rather than glutamate uh, as a neurochemical that it releases along with serotonin. Uh, into the amygdala and the hippocampus and other places in the brain, and the hypothalamus, I mean to say, wow. But what are we going to do about all this, right? I don't want to just get lost in the science of it, but I want to really bring it down to earth. Now, it's also true, by the way, I should add, that while this is research on mice, um, humans, like you and me, who have PTSD, they've had traumatic learning that kind of by definition um, gets generalized to many situations other than the very specific situation in which the trauma occurred. When their brains, they're dead now, are autopsied, and neurons in the RAFE nucleus are examined, they too have had this switch flip. So let's explore first what we can do to prevent the switch flipping in the first place. And second, let's explore what we can do if it has already flipped. And in all this, for me at least, there's a there's a power in this in which you really get how mechanical it is. It's about circuits changing. What can we do to prevent a, you know, the circuit changing? And what can we do to get it back to its original, more peaceful resting state? And how does this apply to your own life? 
right? It's really helpful to reflect on um, how we overgeneralize. Right? Something uncomfortable happens with a certain with a person, then we overgeneralize to all people. Maybe something happens uh, with a particular person. So then you now overgeneralize to all future interactions with that person. Maybe something happened when you expressed yourself from the heart or tried to do something and it didn't go well. That one time in that one particular situation with all the particular characteristics of it and then you generalize to suppressing yourself ever after. This is a really far-reaching mechanism. It's Mother Nature's plan. It promotes survival, but it sure does create a lot of unnecessary suffering, a lot of unnecessary unhappiness and contraction. And this mechanism that I've described here and others like it um, really keep us from being liberated. They impair our freedom in moving out in this life. So I wanna uh, name some headlines and then respond to questions in the chat, okay? So headline number one, <clears throat> prevention. If you are uh, in a situation and you wanna help yourself not overgeneralize from it, It is as uncomfortable as it is. There is the first dart of the situation, whatever the situation is, but do everything you can to prevent the second darts of stressful upset that releases a lot of cortisol. In other words, if we grow, go through situations that are unpleasant, they're uncomfortable, they're painful, but we're not, we're, we're not adding a lot of cortisol a lot of stress hormone to it, then the switch doesn't flip. Okay? This has a lot of implications. You might say, yeah, thanks, Rick. Better, easier said than done. I know, I know. But still, when we're in situations that feel scary, keep reminding yourself. Keep dampening your cortisol levels, not out of suppressing, but out of nurturing yourself, right? Keep reminding yourself like you're at the dentist office. This pain will pass soon. They're well-intended. They're trying to help me. It's going to be better. I can slow this down. These are all, feel your toes, wiggle your toes. These are all things I do because I've had a lot of dental work. Um, you're there. It's unpleasant, but you're now adding cortisol to it, which is the necessary ingredient in this switch flipping. Okay? Headline number one, you may want to ask me about it, okay? Headline number two, let's suppose that the switch is flipped. And to be clear, the mechanism I've described is not the only way we acquire fear learning and overgeneralize um, unnecessarily, but it's a very specific one that's well specified and identified at this point. And remember, including in the brains of people with PTSD. So let's suppose it's happened. What can you do? A major thing to do is to recognize the process of overgeneralizing and try to almost catch it before it has really sunk its teeth into you and become really believable or credible. Slow it down. Keep reminding yourself, that was then, this is now. These people are nicer. <laughs> <laughs> I also have more capabilities these days. I can assert myself. I can leave the room. I can get an Uber and get out of here, uh, right? So uh, when you're in situations that are starting to trigger you, try to keep reminding yourself about this process of overgeneralizing that's a kind of delusion in effect. Uh, it's making something like something else that's actually not exactly like something else. Okay. Also, when you are experiencing uh, as best you can that you're still basically okay, hope, you know, as best you can that other people care about you, 
They support you as best you can. You're feeling resourced even while you're dealing with this anxiety. Um, really, really take it in. Really, really try to let it land in you. The counter learning, the opposite learning. In other words, when you're actually okay in situations that you've been scared about and you can find a core inside you that's at peace and is calm and is strong, whew, really help that experience sink in. And gradually over time, you'll be, in effect, planting flowers of confidence and courage and calm and fearlessness alongside the weed of that original circuit formation of overgeneralized fear learning. Okay? That's really important. Third, unfortunately, the weed is still there. Hmm. And uh, it might be covered with flowers of new learning, but research shows that we, we, if we haven't pulled the root of the weed, it can come back. And this gets at what I call the eraser protocol, because like the born identity, you know, the eraser protocol. Here's what you can do. Not just at the time that you're, you know, really deliberately doing the second suggestion, second headline of internalizing, you know, antidotes experiences that are the antidote to what you're scared of, including experiences of soothing yourself and being kind and compassionate toward yourself and um, encouraging yourself, all right? In addition to that, to pull the weed, for some minutes afterward, maybe up to roughly an hour afterward, during what's called the window of reconsolidation, as the weed of the trauma and the overgeneralized upset tries to reroot itself in the physical machinery of memory stores, during that period, up to an hour or so, deliberately and repeatedly bring to mind the, the neutral, the truly neutral thing that you unfortunately learn to be afraid of. Bring it to mind while feeling perfectly okay. All right. Bring to mind the authority figure. Bring to mind the idea of being vulnerable while continuing to feel basically okay. And that repeated pairing of basic all rightness with um, the thought of or the image of that which you've been unnecessarily afraid of. The repeated pairing of the two will disrupt reconsolidation of um, the fear learning deep in the bowels of memory. There's actually science for this. And then last, uh, some, I think, pretty deep Buddha Dharma related to this. The way that overgeneralization works is that it makes things like each other. And yet, in reality, in which everything is impermanent, and continually changing, everything is new, everything is different. Yes, we might be able to categorize, let's say, all dogs as a category, but each dog is unique. You know, let's say as a kid, you acquired a fear of dogs because you had an episode in which something happened or you saw something happen, and then that overgeneralizes to all dogs. And you can apply that to people or, uh, opening yourself vulnerably, or to trying things in general, right? It gets overgeneralized. Well, what makes generalization work is that it shoves everything into a single category, right? The bad thing happened over here back then, and the switch flipped, and then anything else is shoved into the category of, yeah, same as. And yet, in reality, nothing is the same as anything else. Everything has its own suchness. And if you start giving yourself the freedom to rest increasingly in that sense of the uniqueness of every moment, the uniqueness of every wave in the sea, the uniqueness of every dog, the uniqueness as, 
uniqueness of every moment of the future arriving, right? The uniqueness of every moment of vulnerable, uh, open-hearted expression. Whew. That sense of kind of awestruck recognition of the uniqueness of everything. in a very far-reaching way, blows up over generalizing. And that can be a growing, deepening in practice to abide in that sense of um, the sparkling granularity of reality. Okay. So, science. <laughs> so let's take a look at comments or questions in the chat, okay? A quick recap, you want to help yourself prevent the circuit flipping in the first place by allowing the first start of things that are unpleasant while trying to minimize the cortisol-saturated throwing of second darts. And then if the circuit has developed, um, <clears throat> do what you can. Uh, to help yourself uh, grow the good inside of feeling calm and strong and basically okay while things are in, in situations that you're afraid of. Uh, third, use the eraser protocol uh, for a few minutes or a few dozen minutes afterward to keep disrupting the reconsolidation of the weed uh, in the ground of memory. And then last, as an exploration, See what it's like to enter into life more and more. Like, don't know. It's all fresh. It's all the sparkling, unique immediacy of each moment in which generalization, which is this conceptual categorizing of the brain, uh, just boom, is categorically disrupted. Okay. All right. Let's see. What do you make of all this? Well, a lot of comments. I could see this. Um, all right. A few tangible examples. I think I've given examples, right, of how to do this. So let's say you're afraid of dogs, okay? You've overgeneralized to all dogs from an experience with a particular dog. I got it. So now let's say you're walking down the street and someone walks towards you with a couple of dogs. And let's say further that those couple dogs are not um, on a leash. So, okay, your heart starts to pound. What can you do? One, you can uh, really be mindful of the fact that you are generalizing to these dogs something that happened for you 30 years ago. And you are presuming a kind of threat or attack coming at you even in the face of all kinds of evidence of walking past lots and lots of dogs that are just fine and well-behaved and don't bother you. Be aware of overgeneralizing. Second, remind yourself, you're strong, you're okay. Keep noticing that the dogs are not trying to attack you. Keep reminding yourself, I can behave like a smart human around dogs and not do stuff that freaks them out a little bit. Um, you know, keep, uh, drawing on your inner strengths of communication, you know, making eye contact with the uh, guardian of the dogs uh, who's, you know, tracking that you're a little uneasy maybe. You're resourcing yourself. And as you experience these resources that help you cope in the present, really, really let that sink in. Really help it sink in. Those are like flowers you're growing in the garden of your mind. And then after you walk past the dogs, you know, if you can remember to do it, over the next um, half hour or so, uh, you know, bring to mind, you know, establish yourself in calm and okayness, and then just bring to mind dogs. That's it. Just bring them to mind for a few seconds, in a little bit, and then let it go, like maybe over the course of a single breath or even half a breath. Fine. And you're starting to associate all rightness with the stimulus, dogs in general. And that dis gradually disrupts the reconsolidation of the linkage between neutral stimulus of dogs in general and that emotional triggering of fear. Right? And then 
uh, last, if you can do it, while you're with the dogs or <laughs> even afterward, just kind of trip out on the uniqueness of everything, you know? And that disrupts generalization categorically. Okay, as Char asked me, um, let's see, what do you do if you're being constantly um, triggered by exposed to the reason you are overgeneralizing? Well, then you're, you're gonna keep learning it, right? What you might do if you're constantly exposed to that thing which is um, threatening you know, is to do what you can to gradually find a way to, to be with it and cope with it so that you don't feel so threatened by it. It's unpleasant, but it need not threaten the core of your being. This is really crucial. Can you deliberately strengthen and get in touch with a sense that in the core of your being, you're still okay, you're still intact, right? And you know that's a way that's a, that's a fundamental process of coping, and obviously take the actions that you can take if you're constantly exposed to the reason you're overgeneralizing, like a relationship or a situation. What can you do to change that? And sometimes we can't; we're just stuck. So then we can work in, only inside ourselves. But very often, there are things we can do outside of ourselves to change that situation. It's just not good for us. And we do we do what we can realistically, okay? Um, yes, uh, Christy asked a question, the technical question. GABA in general promotes easing and relaxation. I found I found myself wondering about the same question. Why would it be that a switch from what is typically an excitatory neurotransmitter um, to what is typically an inhibitory neurotransmitter would uh, excite fear? I don't know. <laughs> I do know that it's complicated. The brain's complicated and different neurochemicals have different functions when they're applied in different ways. It may be, and this is a speculation in the paper, that these neurons uh, project to the hippocampus, which uh, creates context. And um, uh, the hippocampus regulates the hypothalamus and and the amygdala, and it may be that the inhibitory effect of the switch with GABA now into the hippocampus disrupts its regulation of the amygdala and the hypothalamus. So no longer is um, the person able to put things in context and merp, you know, the fear circuit is established uh, in an unregulated kind of way, maybe. Okay, let's keep it practical. Let's see. Um, I'm seeing questions here. Uh, well, let's see here. So Catherine, I'm confounded about how to trust your gut when practicing overlooking and denying what it is telling you. I, I'm, that's a, if I'm following you right, uh, Sometimes general, generalizing makes sense. If all dogs are threatening, then it makes sense to generalize to all dogs. If all speaking from the heart is threatening, you know, it makes sense, right? Uh, and there are certain situations where, yeah, uh, it is really threatening and it's appropriate to overgeneralize to it. I'm thinking about people, mountaineers who go into avalanche zones and need to be extremely careful. And yeah, it's appropriate there. That's true. The question is, in those situations, when reason tells you that you are overestimating the likelihood of a bad thing, and you are also overestimating the consequences if the bad thing does happen, and also underestimating how you would cope with it, in the unlikely event that the bad thing does happen with significant consequences, right? So that might sound really rational, but still we need to use reason in helping ourselves. I'm speaking about situations where you, like, you know that other people can do public speaking, or you know that other people 
uh, can assert themselves and it goes okay, or, or you know that other people uh, enjoy being with dogs, let's say, and you'd like to be able to grow into that yourself, and you'd like to become freer and not so controlled by those old fears. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about, which is widespread. Certainly, it's been widespread in my life, um, and it's, I think, widespread in the lives of other people. All right, great. Um, let's see, with what terms? Well, Sandra asks, where can you look? You know, if you just use the phrase fear learning, or if you also drop in amygdala, or, um, yeah, I would, you're going to find a lot of stuff there because this is a very hot area of research. Okay, great. Um, all right. So I'm going to finish up here. I see what has come in. As, as you know, I will read all the chat um, after we finish here in a moment. Um, the takeaway. Takeaway. We're designed to be scared monkeys. If you, like me, are a scared monkey, you're normal. How can we help ourselves? We can help ourselves be in situations that feel threatening with as little cortisol as possible. We can help ourselves by being aware, if we've already acquired an overgeneralized fear, of the process of overgeneralizing and start to challenge our perceptions about it. You know, uh, I was driving home with my wife uh, from, from an appointment today, and we drove past a line of cars, stopped at the left turn at a stoplight, and the light was green for us. So I just maintained my velocity, you know, driving under the speed limit, but going, you know, 37 miles an hour. And she was really nervous because we were driving past a whole line of parked cars. She had overgeneralized that somebody in that line of parked cars might dart out into our lane, which is an extremely unlikely event, at least where I live. And, you know, for her, it didn't seem like she was overgeneralizing. You know, she would have actually changed lanes, which exposes her to other risks, or really slowed down, or grabbed my arm <laughs> and started yelling at me, all of which are bad. Um, out of that overgeneralizing. So recognizing overgeneralizing, really helpful, right? And then engaging the other practices I've talked about. Uh, fundamentally, as I finish here, enjoy what it feels like to be, as the Buddha recommended, to be peaceable, friendly, and fearless. Can we move through life feeling fear when it's appropriate? Okay. But more generally, feeling fearless, peaceable and friendly and fearless when life affords us that opportunity. Enjoy it. Enjoy that fearlessness. For me, it's just been wonderful to release unnecessary dread. Ugh, you know? Unnecessary background anxiety that becomes the new normal. You hardly notice it, but it's there. You notice it when it's not there, all right? Wonderful to be freer and freer from those sources of suffering, which then often lead us to create conflict and harms with other people, all right? What's it like, moment after moment, when it's appropriate, when it's earned or afforded or allowed, What's it like, moment by moment, to feel free of fear? Can you enjoy it? Can you extend those moments as it is appropriate in your own real life? That's the invitation here.